Design. 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 Design means to plan. Human. Substance. Technology. Designing for a better future. What is design really? Let's talk about design. Making an impact in the world. The power of design to improve life. Design to survive. Fake, Fake news. news. Two words that infamously defined former US President Trump. Though many of his fake news claims, anything that painted him in an unfavourable light, were never backed up with proof. Fake media is a very real threat to our global society. But even this simplistic fake was shared over half a million times in a country with a population of less than four million. Manipulated digital media began rather innocently, often humorously tweaked photos from sharks swimming in flooded shopping malls like a little shark fin sticking up out of, oh, look at it. To pilots hanging out of planes, distributed via chain emails, blog threads, and early social media platforms like MySpace. What, the, what, what got the word out for MySpace? Because it did happen pretty quickly. Yeah, it was all about people telling other people. Anyone with possible photo editing skills could create an alternate reality, and with the click of a button, send it out into the world for a no doubt lengthy and unpredictable life cycle. Fake or altered media is an accepted norm of our digital lives today, but a little harmless fun has turned into a heedless, uncontrollable conundrum. Currently, more than 80% of imagery is captured on mobile phones, and thousands upon thousands of apps exist just to edit photos and videos. With the right programs, even the most inexperienced creators can produce the most convincing fake content. In fact, most of the services we interact with on a daily basis use these manipulated visuals. And even a simple optimized selfie can have far reaching and unsuspected consequences. My video has been manipulated and my lips synchronized to someone else's voice. For makers of fake news, those who want to deceive other people for commercial or political reasons, these tools could be devastatingly effective. Not only is fake media spreading misinformation and enabling fraud, but has eroded public trust in digital media as a whole. And determining what's real or fake today is like trying to empty a flooding cruise ship with a tiny porcelain teacup. As technology has birthed these problems, could it also provide the answer? While it may be impossible to clean up the masses of fake media littering cyberspace, perhaps the solution is to make sure it's never created in the first place. Welcome to Can Design Save Us, a series exploring design as a pioneering force for good. We dive into the most pressing problems of our time and meet people using design to solve them. We explore the good, bad, complex, and controversial. My name is Leslie Price, host from the Index Project, and my guest today is Sharif Hanna, VP of Research and Development at Trupic. Trupic is a digital notary for images and videos. The company uses groundbreaking technology to authenticate visual media as it's captured and is one of the most effective methods to ensure what goes online is real. Today, Trupic has a broad user base to combat fake media, ranging from citizen journalists to Fortune 500 companies. But um, I should just say welcome to the program and thank you so much for joining us. Oh, thank you. It's, it's great to be here. Really appreciate it. So I would love to hear to kick off, in your own words, sort of what does TruePic do in a nutshell? TruePic creates secure camera technology that allows both people that are capturing photos and videos, as well as uh, people receiving those photos and videos uh, to be assured that they are authentic photos and videos that were created by light mm-hmm. uh, and not uh, you know, created by an AI network or uh, by manipulation in some kind of editing program, um, that what they're looking at is what was in front of the camera. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, and this is a way for us, uh, we view it as a way to kind of restore trust in the internet. Um, there's a lot of, uh, you know, personal transactions, personal decisions, commercial transactions, you know, all sorts um, that are driven by what we see and hear online. Mm-hmm. And so we thought it was important to give uh, both people as well as organizations the ability to be able to know with a high degree of confidence that what they're looking at 
actually happens uh, in real life. A high degree of confidence. I like that. But um, you have a very interesting background. I mean, last time we talked, you called yourself a tech optimist. I mean, how did you come to work with uh, tackling fake media or working with TruePic? Yeah, so my background, I'm an electrical engineer uh, by training. So I, I started my career uh, designing chips, uh, integrated circuits. And, um, you know, through a sequence of, of events, uh, I ended up at, uh, at Qualcomm. And Qualcomm is... Um, the world's largest maker of uh, chipsets for 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 mobile devices for smartphones, mm -hmm. and um, you know, and towards the end of my tenure at Qualcomm, we were looking at the power of AI as well as five G. So these two kind of emerging technologies, you know, if the two were to come together, what kind of new experiences would we be able to provide? And one of the things that we looked at was, uh, you know, real time translation of video chats. So. Mm -hmm. You know, two people at opposite ends of the screens, um, one person speaking one language, but the person on the other end hears them and sees them as if they were speaking their native language. Okay. And, um, you know, working through that, um, it became clear very quickly that we're essentially, you know, that the technology is on the verge of existing where we can put words in people's lips, right, because of this, you know, deep fake technology and the advancements in AI and, you so know, very high So subtitles in real time, basically. Correct. Correct. Yeah, but, okay. you know, ultimately it's putting words in people's mouths, right? Um, okay. And so, <laughs> you know, that, that created a, a bit of a panic of saying, okay, well, maybe that's a great application, but we also need to be able to tell if something is real. And, sure. uh, you know, we ended up finding this little company, local company called Trupic that was working on technology to do that, just that, uh, mm -hmm. you know, prove, you know, that uh, photo or video is real and unmanipulated. And we decided to bring them in and strike up a partnership. And I uh, just ended up falling in love with, with the company and, and with the mission. And, uh, you know, I, again, back to the, you know, techno optimist thing, I, I, I am convinced i think and there's lots of evidence that over millennia now we've seen that technology can actually uh improve people's lives and can bring better outcomes if designed carefully mm -hmm. um and I, and I do feel technology like this actually does have uh, the opportunity to restore trust in in what we see and and here online and so after you know trupa gave their presentation and the kind of work they were doing mm -hmm. uh, i just fell in love and you know got in touch with them after and said i want to join the company i want to help you on this mission and build this technology out yeah, brilliant. I actually said tech optimist is a techno optimist. I was I was looking back at the transcript uh. <laughs> and I was wondering if I had it right. So it is techno optimist. Yeah, tech optimist, techno optimist. Yeah, <laughs> okay. it's, you know, which is not really kind of in vogue because I think in the past few years we've seen also how technology that is not designed well can right. actually do a lot more harm. So mm -hmm. um, you know, with that in mind and being conscious of the lessons kind of gained uh, from the past few years, mm -hmm. I still think in the balance technology can actually help uh, if designed correctly. So yeah, I'm a techno optimist. Yeah. yeah. No, it's good to hear. We often, yeah, obviously don't hear the <laughs> the best things about tech sometimes. But um, when you joined TruePic, you had a great story about how they were, was it looking to support Syrian activists on the ground during the civil war? Yeah, so this was this was the the story that really just made me decide then and there when I heard it that that's it I'm leaving and I'm going to go join this company. So um, we actually one of the uh, members of the executive team at Trupic, uh, Munir Ibrahim, he's a former U.S. diplomat. So he was stationed in the embassy in Syria, U.S. embassy in Syria when um, you know when the civil war broke out there, um, and uh, he ended up you know joining Trupic. And one of the things that um, you know, he realizes that activists on the ground in Syria had this problem where there were attacks against civilians mm. um, and they would document, you know, the, the aftermath of these attacks with uh, their smartphones. And one way or the other, these photos and videos would find their way out of Syria and in kind of international forums like the United Nations and mm -hmm. um, as kind of evidence of, you know, what, what the regime is doing. Um, but because they were just ordinary photos and videos, and we all know, like, kind of hard to know exactly right if that really happened at that date and at that time or location or if it's you know genuine or if it's been edited or manipulated in some way the activists had a hard time basically convincing the outside world right of what was happening on the ground right um and so um i guess you know uh 
Trupic and this group of activists, they found, you know, found each other, uh, I think with Munir's help. Mm -hmm. And so the activists started using Trupic technology to document kind of the aftermath of some of the attacks on civilians. Um, and then it became very hard, let's say, for adversaries, right, in the international community to say, oh, that's a, that's a fake it's video fake, or yeah. that video is from three years ago versus last week, mm -hmm. you know. Every photo and video came with proof of its authenticity, which then allowed these people that are on the ground to bring the story and make it believable to, you know, to the world at large. Um, and I just thought that that was incredibly powerful and kind of a glimpse into the potential for this technology. And I just completely fell in love with the idea and decided, like, this is it. This is this is what I'm going to go and do. No, and that's completely understandable. And I, I hope your bosses were... Uh... <laughs> understanding of the fact that they lost you to Trupic, but I, I can I can understand why. Yeah. But um, so you were the driving force behind Trupic Foresight, um, which is the technology, right? Yes. I mean, how does it work? If you can explain it to us in uh, simple terms for the non-tech savvy listeners. Yeah, sure. I mean, when we're thinking about here, we have this technology that allows you to capture a photo and video that you know essentially the viewer can trust, right? Um, that at least the, the contents of the photo or video are, are authentic. Now, how they interpret the contents, that's entirely up to them, right? But um, yeah. that, Not something you guys can control. Right, we can't control that, right? Um, but <laughs> yeah. at least the, 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 the pixels, right, and, and the audio and, and, and the location data and whatnot in the photo and video is authentic. So when you think about <clears throat> how do we put this in the hands of people, right, all over the world very mm -hmm. quickly, um, you step back and you realize that 85% of the photos and videos um, that are uploaded to the internet every year come from smartphones. And that's no surprise, right? It's the default camera that everybody has on them <laughs> essentially at all time. And, mm -hmm. you know, it's used for all sorts of things, right? For taking pictures for, you know, personal reasons and for fun, and, you know, documenting vacations and things like that and nights out on the town, but also for other things as well, like, you know, those activists in Syria, right? So, um, how do you bring the technology out so that it is available to everyone in the camera device that they use every day? Mm -hmm. And so that was kind of the origin of, of, of the Trupic Foresight work. Um, and we realized that the answer was kind of twofold. One, we needed this technology to be integrated into smartphones, not as part of an app that you have to download and remember to use, but mm -hmm. just as a native function of the phone built into the camera app that starts by default when you want to take a picture on your device. So yep. that's step one. And then step two, that in if you're going to put the technology out there on that scale, you know, to hundreds of millions of devices, then it really needs to be very secure. Mm -hmm. And so the objective with Tropic Foresight was to achieve what achieve what we call um, hardware, you know, hardware-based security. Yep. And to give you a sense of what that is, it's the same type of technology that is used in smartphones today, for example, to secure our fingerprints, right? Mm -hmm. If we're logging into the phone using our fingerprints or, you know, using our face authentication, biometric authentication, mm -hmm. it's the same type of technology that secures our transactions when we're buying something online or using, you know, a digital wallet, you know, to use a, a digital version of our credit card to pay for something. Mm -hmm. Um, so all of those technologies use kind of a special part of the, the chip, the, the main chip that's inside the phone um, to kind of isolate this sensitive information away from the rest of the device. Mm -hmm. um, and so the, the theory was, hey, can we use the same type of technology to protect the uh, the operation of, you know, capturing data from the camera mm -hmm. um, and seal it, right, before anybody else can change it or manipulate it um, and essentially seal it permanently so that it, if there's any change from that point forward, it can be detected. Yep. Um, and that's precisely what we did. And so we worked with Qualcomm, uh, my previous employer. So that was essentially I came on board to, to help drive that project. Yep. Um, so we had a very close partnership with them uh, and we collaborated on, you know, taking Trupix technology, bringing it to this very, very secure environment, um, and also make it a, a native, uh, you know, a function within the device. And so, uh, you know, we have these prototype devices that if you bring up the camera app uh, in it now, as you know, like when you bring up the camera app, there's multiple modes that are available. There's mm. photo, there's video, there's portrait mode, there's panorama mode. Essentially, what we did is we added another mode called secure mode. So okay. you swipe over to that, you touch the secure mode option. And then at that point, when you capture the photo, um, 
you know, it works as you would expect, but the difference is that inside the photo file itself is the proof of its authenticity. Mm -hmm. And the way that that photo file was captured is through this, you know, s secure hardware mechanism okay. um, that also protects your fingerprints and everything else. So that's, that's what Foresight is. We talked about it at some point that, you know, of course, there's so much fake media out there and, you know, there's a difference between stopping it in its tracks, which you guys are doing, um, and then also trying to tackle it from the other end. Of and the, But I mean, there's so much out there. How does one even begin to do that? So, I mean, it, tell me why you guys basically think it's most effective to, to stop it in its tracks, I guess, from the very beginning, from the origins. Yeah, um, it's a great question. And this was actually kind of a raging debate in this you know, community <laughs> of people that have been tackling this uh, this uh, this problem set. And there were basically two major approaches, right? As you said, so one of them is you have a photo or video, you don't know where it came from, mm -hmm. and you want to detect, right, if it's been manipulated in some way or if it's been created by AI. Mm -hmm. So that's the detection approach. And then the other approach is where we sit, which is the provenance approach, right, which is you are um, creating... Um, you know, an authenticated chain of provenance for that media, exactly how it was captured. If it's been changed in any way, you're, you're tracking the entire life cycle of it right from the instant that it's created. Mm -hmm. And so when we think about the detection approaches, it's actually quite tricky because, first of all, most, you know, image-based deception, whether for photos or videos online, is not actually because of manipulated media. Mm -hmm. It's an authentic photo or video it hasn't been changed in any way, but it's presented as being from a different time in a different place. Right, okay. Right? Um, there's an example of this a couple of years back. There was a flare-up in, in conflict between India and Pakistan, and um, there were f videos of a downed fighter jet, right, that people were sharing, that saying that this happened in this latest altercation, but it wasn't. It was actually from four or five years prior at a different location, mm -hmm. but it was circulating. And so this, and this is very, very common, right, miscontextualized photos and videos. So there, let's say, that you did build, you know, a perfect detector that can tell you that the video is 100% authentic. That's correct, but it's still giving you the wrong information because sure. the video is authentic, but it's from a different time and place. So that's one kind of set of the, the context of the image is not something that is solved by just looking for manipulations in the pixels. So that's one. Mm -hmm. The second is, is that the the very nature of how AI based manipulation and synthesis works is pitting two AI networks against each other. One of them mm -hmm. creates forgeries, and the other one tries to detect if that what was produced is a forgery or the, or is the real thing. And they go in this loop, right, thousands of times, right, until the forger that you know creates something the detector just cannot tell anymore. Mm -hmm. So okay, so that's how like deep fakes work, right? Um, my favorite example. Of that is if you visit the website called thispersondoesnotexist.com. Yes, uh, no, I've seen that and it's <laughs> extremely creepy. It's like yes. the the, the faces are just slightly off. Yeah, that's right. And, and that's yeah, every, fully, yeah, yeah false of like uh, fake people created, right? Just out of algorithms. Correct. Yeah, yeah. And so every time you press refresh, it creates a new you know, face of a person that doesn't actually exist. It's entirely Yeah, the synthetic. eyes are always slightly off, but uh, right. yeah. <laughs> well, it's yeah. good that you can tell. We can have you kind of check every photo of <laughs> that's uploaded. Well, I can imagine the manpower you'd need, right? This yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, well, this is, and this is the issue, right? So then, so essentially the way that, um, you know, AI-based synthesis works is you are, every time you create a better detection mechanism, you're at the same time, training a better forger. So any mm -hmm. algorithm that we can come up with to tell you know, real from fake, that algorithm can be used to train a better forger. So it's just, you're, you're stuck in this race, essentially perpetually, right. right? There's no, it will never end, right? Because every time you come up with a new way to detect, that can just be used to train a better forger. And as a matter of fact, um, you know, Facebook launched um, what was called the Deep Fake Detection Challenge in late 2019, fall of 2019, I believe. So it was mm -hmm. this, you know, international contest, huge prize purse. It was like a million dollars. Um, and they called on the best teams in the world, right, to, to try to create, uh, you know, a deep fake detector. Mm -hmm. And the winning algorithm, 
So the algorithm that won, the best one, had uh, uh, you know had a success rate of sixty five percent. So it was only able to tell correctly label real videos as real and fake videos as fake sixty five percent of the time. And so yeah. imagine at the scale of Facebook, right, where God knows how many millions of photos and videos are uploaded there every day. Mm -hmm. Imagine if 35% of them are mislabeled. So we have real yeah. videos or, or photos that are being, you know, um, labeled as being manipulated in some way. And then mm -hmm. fake ones or manipulated ones that are being labeled as authentic. In both cases, it's it's a disaster, right? Yeah. Um, and so <laughs> um, even at 90% scale, right? Even if the accuracy was 90%, even if it was 95%, right? Mm -hmm. That last 5% would still could do, you know, a lot of damage because of the scale of these social media platforms. And so we think that the detection approach is just, you know, it's not sustainable. It's not scalable. It can just can't handle the type of traffic that's there. So instead of trying to detect what's fake, we aim to prove what's real. Yeah. So which is to say, hey, Manipulated media is always going to exist. There's actually good use cases for it, mm -hmm. sometimes like for art and satire and other things. So let's not really worry about that. What we want to do is create a new breed, a new class of photos and videos. For Sometimes you really need to know right, that this photo or video is real. Mm -hmm. And so it's almost like the organic food section at the supermarket, right? The, the, the supermarket is full of food, but there is a certain subset of the items in that supermarket that are Ex explicitly labeled as being organic. Mm -hmm. And so we it's kind of the same thing, right? There's all photos and videos out there. That's the giant set of everything. And then there's a subset of those that are labeled as, you know, authentic. And you can trust that what you're looking at is what came out of the camera. Mm -hmm. And so we think that that's a much more scalable uh, approach. And that's why we're, you know, big fans of, of the provenance camp and we're, why we're driving the technology there. Mm -hmm. No, I mean, it makes complete sense. But I mean, you, you just touched on it there that, you know, of course, on the flip side that you talked about why it's important to still allow for visual media to be manipulated for creativity. But I mean, yeah, could you tell us a bit more about that? I'm, I'm just interested to hear your personal opinion. Yeah, I mean, it's... Um... There is nothing inherently wrong in manipulated media, right? That when, fundamentally, when you look at it, I mean, like we go to the movies, right? That's full of you know scenes and things and events that don't exist in real life, which is awesome. Mm -hmm. We love that. It's our you know escapism. It, it allows for creative freedom, um, and sometimes it can be important for, let's say, political satire. Right. If yeah, somebody sure. creates a deep fake of a politician saying something, uh, you know, sometimes that could be done for malicious purposes. That's possible. But mm -hmm. it could also an artist could be doing it to speak truth to power. Right. To bring sure. a point across uh, that is much more visceral. Right. When it's shown in kind of an, an audiovisual form. Um, and so. We have to be careful. I think a lot of governments right now are trying to figure out how to tackle the deep fake uh, problem and just manipulated media generally. And we think, uh, you know, like a blanket ban of some sort on that is not really very useful because then you are going to be just goes too you know, far, right? It's censorship then. It, go, it goes too far, right? Yeah, it goes too far because sometimes these things are good. We need to give people the ability to express themselves. There's issues of First Amendment and all of that, right? At least in the United States. But the, the concept of, of, of freedom of speech. Um, and the importance of art, right? Um, and so we we need to be able to leave that, you know, leave room for that as a possibility. We can't exclude it. And that's why we think like, hey, leave the, you know, manipulated media, synthetic media, these can have good use cases. And I think there was one very interesting example. There was a documentary um, about the LGBT community in an Eastern European country. Um, and in order for the people to get on the documentary, they didn't want to show their own faces. And so the directors ended up using deep fake technology to swap out their real faces with synthetic okay, ones well, to protect their identities. Yeah. So this was a good, very legitimate use of deep fake technology. And there has to be place for that. So let's keep that in place. It is what it is, right? When we do care about wanting to prove how a certain piece of media came to be, then let's use provenance technology to prove that. Yeah. And so we think it really strikes the correct balance and doesn't tip the scales too much one way or the other. Absolutely. I mean, it's quite a creative use, isn't it? Because, I mean, it's a huge step up compared to the, the you know, where they lower the voice and they have someone sitting exactly. in the dark room. But, I mean, yeah, it's a very creative and very... Uh, yeah, relevant use. 
Um, but you've had some really interesting use cases with TruePick. Um, you had one particular case, which was the 2020 Andrew, is it Walls case um, that was covered over CNN. Could you tell us a bit more about that? Yeah. So um, last year, you know, for the 2020 elections in the United States, there was a lot of fear about the potential for the use of manipulated media to, you know, sway the elect, you know, electorate uh, one way or the other. Generally, mm -hmm. there was um, so there was this high school student uh, that ended up creating a fake politician persona um, and managed to get uh, Twitter to give that you know non-existing politician uh, a verified Twitter account. And mm -hmm. uh, the way that with worked the is that blue check mark, right? With the, the little blue check mark. And, and what happened there is that um, Twitter relies on information from this, uh, um, this organization called Ballotpedia. Um, and Ballotpedia essentially has a, a record. It's a, a Wikipedia of all political candidates in the United States across all office levels, right? From like mm -hmm. very hyper local, you know, offices all the way up to, you know, highest levels of federal government. Um, and so this high school student, they went to that website that I mentioned earlier, this person does not exist.com, generated a, a picture of a, a man that didn't exist and created a persona for a him on the Ballotpedia website. generic politician. Um, That's yeah. right. This politician does not <laughs> exist.com, right? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> actually, that's not a bad idea. Maybe we should... Uh, not anyway, somebody's going to do it at this point if they're listening to this. Um, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Give people and, some, some good ideas. That's right. And so created this fake persona, uploaded it to Ballotpedia. Because it was on Ballotpedia, then Twitter you know, relied on that information to grant that, you know, personality, the blue check mark. And after the high school student successfully executed this deception, he went to CNN and said, hey, look what I was able to do. Um, and so we saw that and we're like, man, this is like one of those use cases where we know we can help because our, you know, our technology is already being used by, um, you know, banks and lenders and international development organizations to verify facts on the ground, right? Like a project that was funded, you know, tracking its progress or things like that. So we reached out to Ballotpedia and we said, hey, we think we may be able to help. Mm -hmm. And so what Ballotpedia started doing is when somebody tried to submit, uh, you know, uh, a new uh, profile, political uh, profile on, on Ballotpedia, um, they would do an inspection essentially using TruePix technology to confirm that the person is real, confirm, you know, their uh, identify, like their ID, like, you know, state driver's license or whatever else, to confirm that it's a real person, right? Um, right. And not, you know, a situation like that. And then by the end a of the 17 year old elections, kid just having a good that's time. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Having uh, having a good time and the, you know, the notoriety of having pulled such a deception. Um, <laughs> yeah. And, and so by the end of the 2020 election season, we had, you know, uh, Ballotpedia had used our technology to verify over a thousand political candidates in 50 states. Mm -hmm. And so, um, and, and that was great to see the technology kind of play uh, an active role in, in protecting the U.S. elections. Um, and also, you know, for us, it was really kind of confirmation of the potential for this technology. It's like, here's a technology that's used by insurance companies, but it's also used to verify, you know, the authenticity of political candidates. I mean, it just spans the gamut and it speaks to the power of photos and videos as a communication medium and as a way for us to internalize information that we make decisions based on. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, that was one of the most interesting ones in, in 2020. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's, um, I read the CNN article and he said that he had no malicious intent, that you right. know, it was all a bit of fun. But I mean, in your experience, is this sort of one of the most... Um, I guess, a sinister ways that people could be basically using manipulated fake media? Uh, there are. I mean, you would have to be real. It doesn't take a lot of creativity to imagine all of the nightmare scenarios, right, that are possible uh, with, with manipulated media. And mm -hmm. honestly, it, it spans the gamut from, you know, things that are not a huge deal to things that are potentially dangerous and in so many different use cases. I mean, dating websites, for example, right? You, yeah, like catfishing you know, somebody, on Tinder or, yeah. That's right. It, it could be somebody just de-aging themselves a little bit, right, for their <laughs> profile picture. Yes. Or it could be somebody, you know, completely misrepresenting who they are and then, you know, the other person shows up to the date and, you mm -hmm. know. Hopefully nothing bad happens, but or a deception on like peer to peer commerce marketplaces. Mm -hmm. Somebody's buying something from a person on the other side of the internet. 
does that item, is that actually the condition of the item that it's in? Or did they upload a photo of the item in pristine condition, but the current state is not really, I mean, it, and, and then all the way to fake political candidates and influencing elections, right? Mm -hmm. So it really runs the gamut of, mm -hmm. of potential, you know, vectors for deception here, which is why we think this has to be solved not on a kind of like case by case basis, but we have to create a technology that could be used just everywhere that photos and videos uh, are used today. And that could also extend to things like, you know, dash cams in cars, police mm -hmm. body cameras, right, that are used in a lot of yeah, um, right. a lot of places to do, you know, for prosecutions or, or for defense, right? I, you know, the cop, you know. And so if imagine if all of those things are called into question eventually. And this mm -hmm. is a, a phenomenon that there are these two legal scholars, uh, Bobby Chesney and Danielle Citron, uh, Danielle Citron from uh, in the US, they came up with the concept of the liar's dividend as an effect okay. of deep fakes. So the liar's mm -hmm. dividend is the idea that people that do have malicious intent can use the possibility, right, that a photo or video is fake to essentially deny, you know, some some wrongdoing that they were captured on photo and video. Yeah, if you uh, cast saying enough doing... doubt, right? Yeah. Okay. Exactly. Yeah. So it's like, hey, that wasn't me. That's a deep fake. I didn't say this thing, right? Mm -hmm. I didn't do this thing because and all you would need to do is essentially for the viewers to be aware that, you know, such widespread manipulation is possible and that's enough to shake all our collective confidence, right, mm. in the information we're receiving via photos and videos. And then that's really kind of the worst possible scenario, right? If you were to kind of read the tea leaves of what's going to happen five years from now, 10 years from now, as the technology for manipulation gets more and more sophisticated, if we really just can't trust anything at all in the photos mm -hmm. and videos that we're seeing, then we're in real trouble. And so we're trying to stem that, you know, uh, from the, again, from the origins, right? Yeah. Uh, try to reinstill a sense of confidence of saying, no, you can actually trust that what's in this photo actually happened. How you interpret it, that's up to you. But at least let's get to an agreement. These pixels that you're mm -hmm. looking at came Later from what? Lie. Yes. When we talk about, I guess, um, I mean, fake media in general, do you sort of view in your personal, personal perspective that social media companies are sort of I wouldn't say the catalyst, but I could say potentially yeah, instigator or propagator of fake media, or in your view, is sort of the fault within the maker. I'd just be interested to hear your perspective on this. Yeah, it's one of those things where I think there are so many factors at play, to be honest. I mean, mm -hmm. ultimately, the responsibility rests on the person that wanted to affect the deception, but then, you know they use tools right to help them be more effective you know at at uh passing along that deception right and and so the combination of the incentive structures i think for what makes uh, an engaging social media post right yeah. that lends more eyeballs and more advertising dollars and you know the, the incentives are not really necessarily aligned with what's there for a healthy conversation now to mm -hmm. be to be fair um the social media companies in the run-up to the 2020 elections i i personally saw a lot of like good faith effort on their part mm -hmm. um, to try to you know label things have yeah, a lot of disclaimers checking yeah. Even with the pandemic as well, yeah. Exactly, and with the pandemic as well. So it's not that they're standing still at all, um, but still at the scale, right, that they're at, it just it becomes almost impossible to do an effective job if you don't have these markers. And that's I think that's kind of the, the potential that we see in this technology, right? So mm -hmm. imagine a breaking news situation of some sort photos and videos start flooding you know twitter and facebook um of uh, you know uh, from that event right from the scene of whatever is happening at that point if the you know this provenance technology right is available it's available in the devices that capture the photos and videos and it's understood by those social media platforms mm -hmm. then they have the power to um, kind of elevate right the posts that have the authenticated content because at least it's like you know, I don't know about this other stuff, but I know that this one has the authenticity mm -hmm. markers inside it, right? So then it gives them another kind of parameters that they can use to tweak their algorithms, right? Which decide mm -hmm. what to expose to the viewers, right? Sure. Um, and so 
that's kind of our hope, essentially, right? That this becomes not an end-all, be-all, but another signal of integrity, right? That can mm-hmm. be used to maybe improve the quality of the content on these platforms um, and allow them to surface higher quality content to the viewers and hopefully with that drive you know better conversations versus the you know the chaos um, yeah that that we've seen in sue mm-hmm. i mean it's also addresses the issue of you know you often read these stories about facebook moderators and the kinds of jobs they have to do if you can replace that with a very effective technology it makes perfect sense yeah well and that's that's uh that's our hope. I mean, mm-hmm. you know, ultimately, there's no there's no removing the humans from the loop. Um, mm-hmm. When we talk about kind of the end viewer, we think of this again as a signal, right? Um, this is a signal that can help you make a personal decision, right, about whether or not you trust, right, this piece of content that that you're looking at, because no mm-hmm. technology can you know, give uh, just a blanket. Yeah, all clear. You can absolutely believe everything that you see in this photo or video uh, or not. Because even even in a hardware secure technology, right, uh, version of the technology, given the right amount of time and the right amount of resources, I'm sure that it will, you know, somebody can break it, right? Mm -hmm. Um, Now, our job is to make it exceedingly difficult to do that. But even (laughs) in this case... At least you're realistic on that front. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We can't, and that's why when I started, uh, you know, at the very top uh, of the recording here, when I mentioned high degree of confidence, so it's not a hundred percent confidence because there is no such thing, right, yep. with technology, but a high degree of confidence that what they're looking at um, represents a real scene that happened, um, and then the decision is really up to the viewer uh, at the end. Mm-hmm. No, well, very transparent of you, but um, the end goal is essentially to get this chip into pretty much everyone's phone, would that be a fair a fair call? Yeah, I mean, to get the technology um, into everyone's hands, right? And so there are, there are actually stages to us doing that. So mm-hmm. earlier on, we essentially have the software versions of all of this. And like I said, we actually have a gr- fastly, you know, rapidly growing roster of customers um, and international NGOs and development organizations that are mm-hmm. already using our technology today. Um, Can we get some to- name drops there? Just yeah. for the listeners, yeah. Yeah, I mean, so there's, uh, I mean, the UN Capital Development Fund, for example, is one of them. The Near East Foundation is another one. Uh, we have large customers like Equifax in the United States uh, and several large insurers that are using the, the technology. Um, so, and that's without kind of the hardware secured version. So we have a mm-hmm. software-based version that is available today. Um, and, you know, we're working on an, another version of the technology that would essentially be integratable into any camera enabled app, right? So mm-hmm. think of, let's say, a dating app, uh, a peer to peer commerce, you know, app, a uh, home sharing app, right? Uh, Airbnb or something like that. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, we're building uh, a new product that, you know, those companies would be able to take and actually integrate right into their apps. So when somebody's taking a picture, let's say if the item they're listing for sale, it would be an authentic picture. So that one is kind of a shorter term goal of ours and gets the technology out there faster. And then the long term play is is the hardware kind of secured version, which we think is, you know, it's the end game. It, it really is what has to happen ultimately before this gets um, truly widespread and, uh, and available to everyone. Um, and but the important thing is that this can't be a tropic only technology, right? So photos mm-hmm. are meant to be viewed and shared. And uh, if you think about the life cycle of a photo or video, yes, you create it on your device, but ultimately you're going to email to someone, you're going to upload it to Facebook or Twitter, you're going to put it in Google Photos, share it with friends, family, maybe your insurance company if you're filing an insurance claim, whatever it happens to be. And so mm-hmm. in order for the technology to truly mature and have the impact um, that we think it will, um, there has to be um, you know, open technical standards that are available for adoption by all sorts of technology providers that live in you know along the the life cycle like stages that a photo or video goes through um in such a way that if a a photo or video is captured you know in a tropic enabled camera and then it's uploaded to a social media website and then it's viewed inside the web browser right it's like Mm -hmm. okay well the camera needs to produce that you know that new type of file the 
social media platform, we need to understand and decode that type of file, right? And needs to mm -hmm. be then when it's shown in the web browser, the web browser, right, would have to understand the type of file to tell you as the viewer that, hey, this is an authenticated photo. Um, and so we are working in a cross industry collaboration to do exactly that, come up with standardized um, ways um, to you know, create these files. This is the content authenticity initiative, that's right. right? Yeah. So the CAI is um, is one of the efforts that's really fake, focused on um, you know content authenticity in uh, creative use cases and in news media uh, use cases. Um, and so we're working alongside Adobe and Twitter and the New York Times and in the content authenticity initiative um, again to to standardize uh, this technology. And there's an actual kind of independent standards body that's already been formed uh, to do that, um, that us and the rest of the CI members are members of, and there's uh, additional members as well. Um, and so we're working collectively towards creating an open standard that anybody can adopt. Because again, if this is a proprietary technology, we don't think it will scale to the scale of the internet. It has to be open. It has to be available to everyone to adopt. Um, and so the work is uh, going, you know, ongoing furiously right now mm -hmm. to, to complete the first version of the, of the standard um, and get the technology out there. Yeah, brilliant. I, I like that you called it a new trust layer for the internet. Yeah, that's 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 our hope, um, and yeah, it's like I mentioned, we we just we even subconsciously or without really realizing it, we rely on visual media for so many mm -hmm. you know personal decisions and business and business decisions that um, if if trust in that evaporates completely, which there's a real risk of that happening, um, then you know we're going to be collectively in trouble and so this is again a, yeah a layer of trust that just ensures that we can still talk to each other and trust what we're all saying you know on opposite ends of different screens you know across the internet yep just like now but uh, what are you guys sort of working on if you can share i guess within the next year um yeah we'd just love to hear yeah um so we're working on that version of our technology that we can make available to all app developers on yep. you know, iOS and Android um, to replace kind of the standard camera function in their apps with the secure camera technology that, that we created. And we really think that that will be, you know, um, stage two at this point, right, of us bringing this technology out to market at a big scale. So stage one is we built the system that's kind of a closed system that our customers, um, like you know, the UN Capital Development Fund or Near East Foundation or our insurance and making customers um, that use it today, but it's, it's a closed system. Next is what we're working on for next year, which is Take, taking this technology and packaging it in a way so that any camera-enabled app can use it and take advantage of it. And again, mm -hmm. the use cases are just too enormous to contemplate all of the different you know types of uh, apps that would benefit from this. And yeah. then the stage three long-term then is the, is the hardware integration. And so this is how we have been sequencing things. And so next year is really going to be a big jump, I would say, in just the sheer number of authenticated photos and videos that will exist in the world as a result of us uh, creating this new product. Um, and I think this is going to be an important moment where it goes from uh, kind of a niche thing to being more widely available and hopefully starting to get people to begin to understand what this new thing is and what's the advantages of it and how to interpret it correctly uh, versus uh, maybe putting too little stock in it or too much stock in it, right? So we have yeah. to strike the right balance. <laughs> and yeah. we think the next year will be important for that. Okay, brilliant. Yeah, I mean, we, we just can't wait to see how it all unfolds. Obviously, at the Index Project, we're big fans of TruePix, so it's it's oh, really, really so exciting. <laughs> but uh, I think that's all we have time for. But uh, again, thank you so much for a really interesting conversation. Um, oh, as thank I said, you so I think much for I, having me. Really appreciate it. Yeah. <laughs> I think I learn a little bit more each time. Um, so yeah, it's always just enjoyable to talk to such uh, innovative companies and uh, obviously using tech for good, as we talked about earlier. But uh, yeah, again, thank you so much. Oh, it's, it's my pleasure. And thank you so much for having some. Really, really, uh, really appreciate it. Thank you for listening to Can Design Save Us by The Index Project. I'm your host, Leslie Price, and this episode was produced by Cecil Cole Noagard with music by Christina Lilleskog.